Chapter 6 Father had just parked the rickshaw in front of the hut. Naima kept her eyes down as she passed it. Inside, she went straight to her mat and pulled the sheet over her head. She felt the thump of her sister landing cross-legged beside her. A small hand fumbled under the sheet to find hers. We need to repair it soon, Mother was saying. With such a ruined rickshaw, you won't get any business for weddings or for other parties. Both of the repair shops in our village are too expensive, Father said, and they don't do good work. Where will you take it? I heard a rumor that Hassan's repair rickshaw repair shop is opening up again in the next village. Old Hassan was the best rickshaw painter for miles around. The best work at the best prices, he used to brag, and he was right. One of his sons must have decided to start up the business again. I'll take the rickshaw there as soon as it opens. It's going to be expensive, Mother said. We'll have to get it painted again and fix the dents and tears. Let me see how much extra money I'll need to make. Naima heard the rattling sound of the tin bank they kept in the wardrobe. We can't use that money, Mother said. That's for Rashida's school fees. Here, take this instead. We'll have to trade it in for the repairs. Naima yanked the sheet off her head. It was just as she'd feared. Mother had twisted off one of the two gold bangles she'd always worn on her wrist. She was holding it out to her father. Naima saw father looking deep into mother's eyes. You were wearing these on our wedding day, he said. Mother smiled. What's mine is yours, remember? Father took the bangle and put it back on mother's wrist. Naima waited for him to declare that she'd never, he'd never sell it. Instead, he said, we'll trade it only if we, can, we can't earn enough money. Naima couldn't believe it. That bangle had been given to her great-grandmother by her mother. The soft clinking of two circles had always made music for their family. Now they might lose that music forever. She lay down and covered her face again with the sheet, wishing she didn't ever have to take it off. The tears were coming fast now. She heard the rustle of her sister getting up. She felt the weight of father's palm in her covered hand, on her covered hand, resting there for a moment. His footsteps crossed the stone threshold. The bell of the rickshaw chimed as he drove away. Someone gently pulled back the sheet. A soft hand smoothed the tangled hair off her forehead. A low voice began a familiar lullaby. Naima wiped her tears and drew a shaky breath. The pain inside her heart loosened a bit. The pair of bangles was still singing on mother's wrist. Maybe father could earn the money for the repairs. Chapter 7 After the crash, father no longer came home for lunch. He was always trying to find passengers while other rickshaws sat idle. He stayed out until midnight in case somebody needed an emergency ride. But mother had been right. People didn't like the look of such a battered and dented rickshaw. They didn't trust a driver who had let his rickshaw get into such state. Every afternoon, Naima searched father's face. The bangle was still on mother's wrist, but for how long? How many days could he work from dawn until midnight without getting sick? A couple of aunts came to visit, sitting outside on the threshold with mother. What's wrong with Naima? One of them asked. We heard she crashed your rickshaw. Why in the world was she driving it anyway? Mother bristled. Everybody makes mistakes. She was only trying to help. She's growing up, you know. Mother came inside to make tea and the voices outside became whispers that carried into the hut. Wrecking a rickshaw is growing up. Doesn't sound like she was trying to help. Something must be wrong with that girl. Salim rode by, ringing his bell loudly, the white handkerchief poking out of his pocket. He even took it out and pretended to blow his nose, trying to make sure Naima spotted the signal. But she didn't push back on the window covering and she didn't and wave. She didn't dash outside so they could exchange a few words. And she certainly didn't slip over to the banana grove to meet him. I'm already a disgrace, she thought. If my aunts catch me spending time with a boy, I'll bring even more shame to mother. During the next couple of weeks, Salim made several more attempts before the handkerchief disappeared and he stops ringing the rickshaw bell. Naima peeked at him from behind the curtain, fiddling with the white ribbon she kept hidden on her wrist under the long sleeve of her salwar kameez. Life was closing in around her like the bushes had been closed in around the rickshaw. She even wished that her parents would punish her for what she had done. But after scolding her that first day, mother never brought it up again. She seemed to think Naima was feeling bad enough. 
Our daughter's so sad these days, she told father one night when she thought the girls were asleep. She doesn't rush through her chores to paint alpanas. She doesn't chatter nonstop about crazy ideas and plans. She moves so slowly and keeps so quiet, I hardly know she's there. She'll be herself again soon, father said, as soon as we got we get that rickshaw fixed. Father's confidence helped a little, but Naima still felt empty and numb. When she closed her eyes, the only thing she could picture was father's beaten and bruised rickshaw. The image of it blocked the alpana designs that used, she used to dazzle her mind with color. But she hardly, she could hardly remember the countless ideas that used to spin in her mind as she washed clothes or chopped vegetables. International Mother Language Day, February 21st, came and went. Naima couldn't bring herself to decorate the family's hut, even though Rashida pleaded with her to try. Rashida and mother did their best, but the prize went to a girl on the other side of the village. Relatives gathered at the great uncle's, at great uncle's house to eat birani chicken and celebrate the holiday. Naima's aunts wore great new silk saris, rustling like wind in the rice paddies. Mother put on her party sari, the one she wore every year. Naima noticed the patch she was trying to hide and how faded the sari looked among the bright colors of the others. Any news about the repair shop in the next village, father asked? I think it's opening next week, someone answered. Hassan's prices and work were always the best for miles around. The crooks who run the shops around here are spreading rumors about that, that shop already. What are they saying? Oh, I don't believe anything they say. They don't want to lose our business. So they're making all kinds of, up all kinds of crazy stories. They're probably telling the truth, an older uncle said. The old man tried to train his sons, but neither one was as good as he was. I'll let you know what I found out, father promised. After the holiday, the days slipped back into their pattern. Rashida was back at school. Father was working day and night. Mother and Naima were doing the household chores in silence. And Salim was riding by stony-faced, keeping his eyes straight ahead as he steered his father's rickshaw up and down the lane. Chapter 8. One day, Father surprised them by coming home early for lunch. The rickshaw's looking worse than ever, he said. It's starting to rust, and Hassan's shop should be open for business by now. I'll go there today, and if it's open, I'll price the repairs. But have you earned enough money, Father Naima asked, even though she knew the answer. The hut was quiet. Mo slowly, Mother eased a bandage over her head and handed it back to her father. He slipped the bangle inside his pocket and fastened the button Mother had sewn on a shirt to keep his earnings safe. Naima's stomach clenched like a fist. She wanted to shout, cry, rip the pocket open, and grab the bracelet, but she knew it was no use. Mother's graceful mo mo movements would never make music again, and it was all Naima's fault. Father cleared his throat. I'll earn enough money to buy another bangle soon. The four of them ate rice and spinach and lentils in silence. Naima made herself chew and swallow, longing to fling herself on the mat and cover her face. But after lunch, father took her hand and led her out into the bright, hot light. Look at our alpanas, Naima. I did already, father. Look closely. Naima let her eyes dwell on the faded pat patterns that mother and Rashida had hastily invented for the contest. She stifled a groan. She hadn't cared much on International Mother Language Day, but now the mistakes made her feel even worse. Do you think you can improve all our upon us, father asked. The contest's over, father, Naima said. What's the use of fixing them now? We lost the prize. Don't do it for the prize, father said. Make them right for their sake. He dropped a kiss on her head and climbed on the cycle seat. Tell mother not to wait up. I'll head to the, I'll head to the repair shop once the customers get scarce. Naima watched him pull away in the beat up rickshaw, her heart sinking. Mother's bangle would be gone by the time he got home. She turned to frown once more at the alpanas on the threshold. The patterns were so off balance. If they'd added a square to the in this corner and one more paisley in the other two, the weight of the whole design would have been worked better. Rashida was standing at the door. Silently, she handed her sister the leftover white rice powder paint, the brushes and colored paints made from burnt earth, lentils, and spices. And then she turned and disappeared. Before Naima could stop herself, her mind began to dance with colors, shapes, sizes, balance, symmetry, patterns. Soon her hands were flying to keep up. She painted for a while, humming under her breath, forgetting everything but her work. 
and then she sat back down and took stock of what she had done. The revised alpanas on the step didn't look like the design she might have invented if she'd started from scratch. <clears throat> Those would have been good. But as she looked closely, Naima had to admit the truth, even to herself. These might actually be better.